Carl Hoppe, Extension Livestock Specialist at the Carrington Research Extension Center, part of North Dakota State University Extension. Today, I'd like to visit with you about rations, feed costs, costs to gain for our background in cattle for fall 2024. We've got some uh, changes this year. Uh, we've got some new crop calves, 2024. It's been a beautiful summer in some regards. Some places have had ample amounts of rain. Other parts have had decreasing amounts of rain. We've had a nice fall for the most part. So stress on wean calves has been pretty minimal. And as you can see, we've got some decent calf growth in our calf that are being weaned this year. And these are pictures from our Dakota Feeder Calf Show project located out in uh, uh, Turtle Lake, North Dakota, where the calves are received, and then they're shipped here to Carrington to be fed out to finish. So if you're ever interested in learning uh, about the feeding and finishing performance of your cattle, by all means, please contact us about uh, feeding cattle uh, and finding out the carcass and growth characteristics of your calves. Uh, feed prices continue to uh, be lower this year, like they were two years ago. Uh, uh, last year, they were quite a bit higher two years ago, and the cost of uh, grain really affects our cost to gain. So with that, let's go through, walk down a trip through memory lane of different feed prices. Four years years ago in 2021, corn was almost $6 a bushel. Alfalfa hay was uh, above $175 a ton. Wheat mids were almost $200 a ton. Feed prices were extremely high. Dry distiller's grain was actually over $200. And thirty dollars a ton. This really drove up the cost of feeds. In two thousand twenty-two, things got even a little bit worse. Prices were even higher with uh, higher price corn and distillage grains is over two hundred fifty dollars a ton on a dry matter basis, <clears throat> or an a, or I should say on an as fed basis. Go to two thousand twenty-three. Last year, corn price dropped two dollars a bushel. That affect all the rest of the prices. And as you can see, even our wheat mid price was down to $150 a ton. Dried distillers are still around $210 a ton. And if we go to 2024, prices have reduced somewhat again. Corn at $377 a bushel, and I'll be using those numbers in our, in our rations and cost of gains later on. Alfalfa hay at $140 a ton. Now, that's pretty decent alfalfa hay. That may not be dairy quality alfalfa hay, but it's higher end. Uh, alfalfa hay that's got decent TDN, uh, like you say, 58%. Some really good hay would be above 60% TDN, but I'm token in North Dakota around 58%. Um, and the protein level would be 16% uh, crude protein. Grass hay obviously would be a little bit less. You put up a little bit later, so the feed quality isn't quite there. We have access to wheat mids in North Dakota, $110 a ton. Soy hulls are also available in North Dakota. That ranges in price from 110 to 160 depending upon which plant you're coming from. Corn silage, I always use that as a price of whatever the corn price is per bushel times 10 is the price of corn silage per ton. So this year we're going to use $38 per ton. And of course, it's definitely high in TDM. Canola meal is a, a sleeper this year for price. It's one of the cheaper priced proteins at $172 a ton. And then you've got dried distillage grains at $145 a ton. And that's on an as-fed basis. You can say this year has been another variable weather year. Some places have been extremely dry, like western North Dakota. you got other places in the center of the state that have had ample amounts of rain. Uh, and uh, the grasses show accordingly. So with that, let's uh, talk a little bit more about different feedstuffs available in North Dakota. We have a lot of distillage grain plants in North Dakota. There's actually five. And of course, distillage grains can provide wet, modified, or dried depending on which plant it is. Most of dried can be handled. Modified is usually the preferred and, and favored source of distillage grains just because it adds moisture to the water, excuse me, moisture to the feed, and uh, uh, conditions the feed quite nicely. There is something called condenser soya soluble. So whenever anybody talks about corn syrup, that is what they're referring to. Always like, my, like to make that distinction. Because when we're talking about... Um, uh, Corn syrup, we actually think of like the carol corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup. So we need to understand what the nomenclature is in our industry. And when we talk about corn syrup from an ethanol plant, it's really condenses to your solubles. And most of that is used, is actually placed on top of modified distillage grains to make a different, uh, to, to sell it out that way. Wheat mids are available in the plant. There's uh, uh, several plants in North Dakota. 
Soy hulls have been the one that's been moving on over the years. Now that we've had two new uh, soybean crushes in North Dakota developed over the past two years, now we have three plants, maybe four, that are producing soybean hulls throughout the year. Corn gluten feeds produced in one plant. Unfortunately, availability of that is really tough. Most of the dairy industry has had that sewed up for a while. We do have potato byproducts in North Dakota, depending upon where you're at in uh, Grand Forks or Jamestown. Of course, if you look for byproducts from potatoes, they really want year-round use. So if you're a seasonal feeder, like most of us backgrounders are, potato byproducts usually never fit into, the, into our rations. Unless, of course, there's a potato warehouse or some potato place that has extra potatoes, and then certainly they can be used. They're very analogous to corn on a nutritional basis, other than they're around 80 to 90% water when corn is 80 to 90% dry matter. Beet tailings, we do have beet plants in North Dakota in the eastern part of the state, and they are an excellent source of feed. Cows prefer the sugar in the beet tailings, and unfortunately, there's usually a lot of uh, dirt in tailings or ash content, so be leery about what you're getting. Um, beet pulp is uh, can come out either wet or dry, uh, and it's a very uh, uh, good feed for use in background in cattle because it's mostly high, ferment or high fermentable fiber. On the other hand, uh, we need to really be careful about how wet these products are because at 80% water, that's a lot of water being hauled down the highway. And a lot of trucking costs can go in for the amount of feed that you actually get when you consider the dry matter basis. Canola mills plant produced in several plants in North Dakota, as well as linseed and sunflower meal. Corn gluten meal would come out of the corn gluten feed plant. Usually that goes in the pet industry or some other industries rather than cattle feed, so it usually doesn't pencil in. Soybean meal is available now in North Dakota from our local plants and uh, is always considered the gold standard of, of proteins. Um, and it comes usually along with a higher price too. Screenings on the other hand, uh, wow, you can get those. If it's corn screenings, it's probably all cracked corn with bees wings that might make it kind of light. Um, if it's some other things like wheat, always be leery about the ergot that could show up in screenings. Ergot and cattle usually don't go together very well. Talk to your local veterinarian about sloughing hooves and sloughing tails and reduced ears and death and abortions and those types of things. And all of a sudden, ergot is not a very favorable feed to be included into your rations. Here's the location of the processing plants across North Dakota. As you can see, where there's more rain, we have more processing plants. And that's on the west eastern side of North Dakota. Uh, Western North Dakota, certainly these feedstuffs can be trucked out west, although you have a trucking charge, which I usually ignore when I do these rations because everybody's trucking cost is different. But by all means, please consider trucking costs into your final F farm delivery price of feeds. As you can see, um, we have a lot of ethanol plants scattered throughout the plant. We have oil crushes scattered throughout the plant, like state, I mean. Uh, when we look at uh, beet pulp, that's up and down the Red River Valley. So again, very available in that region. So with that, let's move on to our next thing. I always like to visit about feed value, cost per pound of nutrient, because we're just not feeding feed. We're actually feeding the nutrients that, that, that the body uses. And that's what we usually have to figure as cost, at least what I do. Well, my first example here is canola meal. On a dry matter base, there's... Usually on a dry matter basis, it's 90% dry matter. So I've got two lines here. The top line is as fed. The bottom line is 90% dry matter basis. So um, if you that's on a dry basis. So crude protein on canola meal, as fed is 38%. On a dry matter basis, it's 43%. So it's fairly concentrated in protein. Energy content of canola meal is less than what corn would be. It's around 70, 69% TDN on a dry matter basis. So when we look at cost per ton, right now canola meal is $117 a ton. Our cost per pound is 8.6 cents. But if you do the math, and that would be take the cost per pound and divide it by 0.387, and you'd end up at 0.222. That's the cost per pound of protein. And then if we do the same thing except using the energy con value, you'd have a 0.13, or excuse me, 13, 14 cents per pound, cost per pound of energy. Looking down through this list, you can see wheat mids. Um, when we look as a protein source, cost per pound of protein, well, on a, let me back up and say, on a cost per pound basis, wheat mids is our cheapest feed here. 
you can see the most expensive would be the protein source. Okay, on a cost per pound or cost per ton. When we look at cost per pound of crude protein, though, you see that canola meal is the cheapest source. So let's consider that for one of our, in our ration, our cheapest source of protein. Now let's look at the cost per pound of TDM. That's the energy content. Well, in this situation, wheat mints continues to be the cheaper source. Now, if you look at corn grain, um, that's pretty competitive with distillers grains, the cost per pound of TDM. So why don't we just feed cattle wheat mints? Because sometimes we need, we need energy in the ration greater than what the feed stuff in the ration can provide. So depending upon our rate of gain, we'll need to have, we could, we could have a wheat mid based ration, but if we want to have a higher rate of gain, we're going to have to include a more energy dense feed with that to increase the rate of gain in the calves. So let's use an example here. We're looking at daily nutrient feed costs for cattle. Got a 700 pound calf. He's eating 3% of body weight. That's usually the thumb rule that we use. So he's got around 17.88 pounds of dry matter intake. Not quite uh, in order for him to gain gain well, uh, he's going to need a 57 megacal ration or 14 pounds of TDN, and his ration should be 13% crude protein. Well, let's just look at the energy cost of the ration. In order to get that amount of energy, it's going to be 14 pounds of TDN at the energy cost used in the previous slide of 8.7 cents per pound. It actually costs us $1.22 a day in energy cost to feed that calf. Okay, now we have a protein cost too. Uh, the calf needs 2.3 pounds of protein. If we figure out the protein cost, we used it from canola meal, it'd be 22 cents per pound. Uh, per head, uh, yeah, per pound is what the cost is. So the cost per day is 51 cents. So just on the surface, we say, wow, we spend a lot more money on energy than we do on protein. That's true. That's exactly right. Although there's something that's going on here, and that is when you buy energy, there's usually protein with it. So when you're buying corn, Corn's just not 100% energy. There's 10% protein in the corn. So let's do some math down below here. We need 2.33 pounds of protein. But actually, when we buy the energy, uh, we're getting 1.74 pounds of protein free, you might say, with the energy. So we really only need to supplement 0.59 or 6 tenths of a pound of protein. 6 tenths of a pound of protein times that 22 cents per pound of cost leads down to about 13 cents per day is needed in protein, additional protein. So as you can see in this example, our energy cost is 10 times more costly than the cost of additional protein. But a lot of times we're always focused on, ooh, that additional cost of protein, that's expensive. Now when you consider what we really do feed the animals and the energy requirement that they need to grow is considerably higher than the protein extra cost. Don't forget water. There is a cost for water, whether you pump it out of a well or you buy it from a rural water supply system, and that's anywhere from two to five cents a day. But then again, as you look at this, when you're spending a dollar and a half a day to feed a calf, two to four cents in water or five cents in water really isn't that much. Well, let's talk about some feed concerns for the fall of 2022. <clears throat> as I always encourage you, test for nitrates when you're testing for feed analysis of the calf. Um, some of our haze might be high in nitrates. You never know. It could be uh, excess fertilization of the pasture or ex of the hay ground, or it could be uh, extremely dry weather that causes an accumulation of nitrates in the hay. Um, it's always good to test to find out where you're at. It's a rather cheap test, inexpensive. I shouldn't say cheap, but inexpensive addition to your nutrient analysis test. I talked about weeds and ergot. Be sure to limit those weed seeds for calves. You know, this isn't a cow, this is a calf. He's a new calf. He's trying to figure out how to eat without mom's milk and mom teaching him what to do. So providing decent quality feeds for the calf usually goes a long way to picking up appetite and teaching calves that eating out of a feed bunk is a good thing and they'll grow quite well for you. This year we had a lot of mature corn with good test weight, um, which actually led to kind of a problem here that we sometimes put up too dry a corn silage just because everything matured at the same time and water didn't hang out to the plants and we had some windy, dry weather. So whenever you put up corn silage that's lower in moisture content, that can always lead to poor fermentation. So be wary about that and look through your pile. It'll be feedable. I don't think it'll ever go to complete fermentation and end stage, but um, be sure to watch for mold and those types of things in your pile when you're feeding corn silage. Um, just a note on hay feed values. 
they're really variable between fields and actually between cuttings. Uh, you can have a first cutting that looks really good if it was cut early or it looks really poor for nutritional value if it's been cut late. So when you look at things like relative feed values, the day of cutting, just a few days in cutting can make a big difference on the performance, on the feed value of the feed. This year, again, we have lower feed costs, but we do have high priced calves. So the two kind of work together with each other. Our feed costs are 40% lower than it was two years ago. Our calf prices are quite a bit higher than it was two years ago. We do have adequate supplies of feed, great costs, probably about the same as they have been in previous years. And uh, the grain price obviously is lower, probably due to a national abundant supply. And of course, when grain prices go down, the price of our hay is also decreased too. So hay prices, uh, when some people have been asking what hay prices are, and when you tell them that it's lower than what they expected, they kind of uh, are concerned because you just have to explain hay prices follow corn price. Do be real, uh, realistic, though, on the expense to call hay. It is very expensive to move hay around the state. So if you have a local area that is has a lot of hay, your hay price is going to be low. If you're in an area that doesn't have uh, much hay production, obviously your hay prices are going to be higher. Here's some rations. I got about uh, 12 rations to go through here. And there's a theme that goes with each, but here's an example. If you want two pounds a day gain, it'll take a ration that's about 13 pounds of hay for a seven weight calf and seven pounds of wheat mids. And that'll meet its protein and energy needs. You can see where the gain is going to be two pounds. The feed cost is going to be 46 cents a pound. That's the cost of pound of gain. That's going to cost you 92 cents a day. If you want to pick up the gain, we got to increase the amount of grain and a little bit better quality hay. So rather than 13 pounds of grass hay, we're going to give six pounds of grass hay and four pounds of alfalfa. And then we got to give them more feed total, which is 10 pounds of, of uh, wheat mids. So we're trying to get more intake into them. And they'll probably eat more because it's more digestible feed. So we got 2.6 pounds per day gain. Our, uh, as you can see, our NEG is now a 45 ration rather than a 35. Our feed cost is 41 cents per pound to gain and our daily feed cost goes up. Please make note of this. As you decrease your feed cost per pound to gain, the cost per day goes up. But the important thing is the, the amount of dollars it took to put on that one pound to gain is less when you increase the gain in the calves. So let's look at 2.8 average daily gain in calves. A little more grass, a little lot more wheat mids. You got to add in some limestone because wheat mids is really high in phosphorus and we don't want urinary calculate to show up. So we got to add extra limestone, which carries calcium. So our calcium phosphorus ratios are now balanced. And we're doing 2.8 pounds per day gain. Um, as you can see, our mega cal this ration is a 47. Feed cost is 35 cents per head per day with a dollar one feed cost. So it helps to go through these rations because you see for a little bit more gain, not only did we spend less dollars per day by figuring out what our ration needs to be, but we actually ended up with the lowest feed cost per pound of gain. And it depends if your calves can handle 2.8 pounds per day gain without getting too fleshy. So let's go to another ration. Here's one alfalfa hay and corn salad. You got the king of forages and the queen of forages mixed the two together at that amount uh, for a calf. And we're getting around 1.8 pounds per day gain. And if you go over the NEG, that's a 38. Uh, feed cost is 6 62 cents per pound to gain or 1.12. Huh, a little bit higher. Uh, that's because all wheat mints are really priced low this year if you can get a hold of them. Okay, let's go to another ration. Grass hay, alfalfa hay, corn grain, wheat mints, a little bit of everything mixed together to make a 2.6 pound per day gain. Look at our feed cost per pound to gain is 42 cents. And the cost per day is about, is actually a penny less than what the alfalfa hay and corn size ration that I just visited about. Now, if you want to pick up our gain to go from 2.6 to 3 pounds average daily gain, as you can see, the ratios of the feeds just change a little bit. The feed stuffs remain the same, just the amounts. Grass hay had 4 pounds rather than 6. Alfalfa hay remains the same. Corn grain goes from 2 pounds up to 6 pounds. And wheat mids decrease from 8 pounds to 6 pounds because the wheat mids, even though they're cost competitive, they don't have the energy content needed to afford that 3 pounds per day gain. So we got a 50 mega cal ration. You can see our feed cost is up, but our cost for putting on that weight gain is actually less. 
So when you're putting on 300 pounds of gain, you've actually got less money stuck into that 300 pounds of gain using this ration than you would the previous ration. Now let's go to a, excuse me, an alfalfa hay corn grain ration. This is, so we put up alfalfa hay and we can buy corn grain. So if you eat 13 pounds of alfalfa hay and seven pounds of grain, we get 2.3 pounds average daily gain. Our feed cost is 60 cents per pound of gain. Our feed cost per day is quite a bit higher, $1.34. Well, we want to get 3.2 pounds per day out of these calves. We want to really grow them. And so with that, we got to increase up the grain in the ration. Now with seven pounds of hay, we got 11 and a half pounds of corn grade, but then we have to add in a protein supplement uh, like a 38% uh, uh, pellet that you'd buy at a feed manufacturer at a pound and a half per, per day. Our uh, cost gain is 54 cents. Our feed cost per day is the highest at $1.74. So again, we got to do these maths to find out what works out for you. If you're going to go 3.2, let's think about finishing cattle. That'd be a 3.5. We're looking at uh, NEG of 56 in these rations. That's for a seven-weight calf. If you're going to finish cattle, we'd really look for a 62 megacal ration. should be even higher in grain and less in hay. As you can see with this, our uh, feed cost per pound of gain is less. And our cost per day, hmm, interesting, about the same as it was with a 3.2 pounds per day gain. So if you're looking at finishing cattle, by all means, uh, pencil in these rations for high corn costs, or excuse me, for higher amounts of corn uh, to be included, and then balance it off with your protein, a little bit of hay to help with rumen function. The last series of rations I want to share with you, and that'd be grass hay at 15 pounds, distillage grains at 5 pounds. So you got a grass hay with a uh, 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 an ethanol plant byproduct. We're looking at 1.7 pounds per day gain. As you can see, our feed costs is 57 cents per pound of gain, and our feed cost per day is less than a dollar. Well, let's spike it with a little bit of corn because we want to go ahead and up the gain a little bit to 2.8. And now all of a sudden our feed cost per gain, pound of gain is uh, 0.39, almost 0.4 cents, quite a bit cheaper than the 1.7 pounds per day gain. And our feed costs go up to $1.11. You want to increase the gain to like that 3.4 pounds per day, just like I said earlier, you increase the corn amount, you increase the distillers, you decrease the hay and balance it off with limestone so we don't end up with urinary calculi. And our feed costs are 35 cents per pound of gain. That's one of the cheapest there that I think we've shared so far. So with that, uh, lots of different rations, many different ways to feed your cattle. By all means, please talk to your nutritionist or your extension specialist and visit about uh, what type of rations could have. Just talk about rate of gain goals. I like to think of calves of less than two pounds a day as a low rate of gain, two to three pounds per day as a medium rate of gain, and greater than three pounds a day is what I'd call a high rate of gain. To get greater than three pounds a day, you really need to have a high grain ration. We're talking 60 to 70% grain or, or distiller's grain byproducts included in the ration, maybe even up to 80, 85% grain in the ration. Um, if you're looking at low rates of gain, it works really well for calves going to the grass cattle market. If you want to pick up the gain, make them look uh, pretty growthy and put on weight without adding on extra fat, or also known as condition, um, two to three pounds per day average day of gain. But you notice, as I said earlier, as you increase the gain, your cost of putting on that gain is usually lower. Which leads me to make a comment about low rates of gain. Usually low rates of gain are high cost. Why do we do that? Because we're actually trying to dress up these calves, to prepare them for performance out on pasture. So the low cost of pasture grass is offset, the low cost of gains based on pasture grass is offset by the high price of backgrounding calves at a low rate of gain. So there's a mix to do. And then of course you got your next problem, which is uh, feeding them to a different market period. And by doing low rates of gain, you've slowed cattle up. So they will go to market three to four to five months later than what other cattle would be. And uh, consequently, hopefully a better market price. Now, let me put in a disclaimer down, down below here. Some cattle really perform quite well. Um, they're genetically predisposed to put on three pounds a day gain. They've got, you might say they have bigger cows, bigger sires, and they can grow quite well without getting fat. 
You need to know the type of cattle you have. If you got mature cows out there that are weighing 1,700 pounds, you can put on a lot of gain on these calves for two months without uh, making them fleshy. If you got 1,200 pound cows, that may not be the case. So be sure to know what your historical performance of the cattle are and use that to your advantage. Again, if you're going to put on 60 pounds, except feed on calves, put feed into calves for 60 days, um, you might look for a higher rate of gain. But again, you're trying to get these calves acclimated to a new ration. And it's really hard to adapt cattle to a high grain ration and have a three pound a day gain average over a 60 day period without creating some type of uh, acidosis or bloating or health concerns because we've moved them up on a higher grain ration which they're not used to um, too fast. That's where your medium rates of gain usually work best. Always encourage you to think about a balanced ration. By balance, that means adequate protein, adequate energy, adequate vitamins and trace minerals and macro minerals. All those need to be considered. Um, one of the, you know, at one time distillers grains was actually priced more competitive than corn. So people would use that in a ration and they wouldn't balance for calcium. And next thing you found some sloughing of feet and leg of the hooves. And it's like, wow, uh, that was easy to go ahead and offset a phosphorus a toxicity, a calcium deficiency, just add in limestone. But if you don't know you need to do that, uh, you might do things you shouldn't do. So by all means, uh, please talk to nutritionists or call me. We can certainly visit about these things so you have a good ration for feeding your cattle. Um, lots of different flexibilities. I tried to highlight on this earlier that you can do three pounds per day gain for 60 days without getting too fleshy, or you can do them a pound and a half gain for 120 days. If I do the math, that's the same weight gain on a group of calves. So it's just a different of how long you want to take care of your calves and where you're trying to get the market to. I do have a lot of pro co-products in North Dakota. I do put out an information sheet. Contact me or your county extension agent in North Dakota for a copy of this. Sources of prices for select co-products produced in North Dakota. Uh, if you can get into a contract, sometimes you can buy this stuff really cheap. Really low price in the summertime if you know that you're going to feed your cattle in the fall. You just need to have a place to inventory it. Or maybe it's just a forward contract so they know what they have sold out. Um, be sure to consider freight costs because that can really affect your uh, uh, cost, especially when you consider if it's a high moisture ration like beet pulp or beet tailings. Actually, these co-products work quite well in our backgrounding rations because they're high in fiber, which will hopefully prevent uh, acidosis issues. And the protein sources are usually quite high because they've taken out the, the starch that can lead to acidosis. And what's left over is high fiber and high protein. Works actually very well in our backgrounding rations. So just some comments on good feed bunk management. Uh, you know, cattle are creatures of habit. They like to be fed every day at the same time. And once you start feeding at a later date or an earlier time, and you keep that habit up, you teach bad habits to your cattle, and that rumen gets fed with feed at the wrong at different times for the microbes to ferment, and you just don't have good synergy in the growth needed for the calf. So if you can feed them every day at the same time, that's the, I'll just say, cat's meow for feeding cattle. Try to do it. They're creatures of habit just like we are. So by all means, please try to deliver feed at the same time. Bedding is always helpful. We've done research here at Carrington that shows that bedding uh, can help cattle um, decrease their energy requirements and increase their gain. And if it doesn't increase their gain, it might increase their marbling composition uh, at later when they get slaughtered. So with that, by all means, please look at it. Pay attention to the water. It doesn't hurt to clean it. If feed aren't, if feed isn't clean out of the feed bunk tomorrow, be sure to look in the water tank to make sure somebody didn't deposit some type of feces that certainly wasn't, just didn't need to be in the water bowl, but cattle certainly don't like to eat, drink out of something that's been defecated in. Moldy feeds, always question of what might be in there. You could have, uh, some aflatoxin, those types of things can be very deleterious. Some of that black mold can really screw up fermentation. Excuse me. Some of the black feed on top of a sage pile can really screw up the fermentation of the calf. So be leery about how you do that. Uh, try to keep calves healthy. It's always easier to keep calves healthy on the front side than it is to try to treat them for disease on the back side. Uh, I had this comment the other day about uh, perfect ration, but he had liver abscesses in the in the calves when they're going to slaughter. 
that's really a ration change where they made the ration change too fast. Or it was feed bunk management where they didn't feed at the same time every day. And that led to just one episode where the mic or fermentation didn't go right and the uh, uh, a little bit of microbes got in the bloodstream and went to the liver and created an abscess, which, you know, how'd you like to feel if you had an abscess in your liver? Probably not going to perform very well if that happened to you. Be sure to balance the rations so you don't end up with urinary calculi or or a protein deficiency when you could have better gain if we would have had just a little bit more protein in the ration. And of course, consider your rate of gain goals. Uh, Onophores always work really well in a ration. They usually provide 5 to 7% improvement in feed to gain. They might help with coccidiosis control too. Implants. Uh, um, by implanting, if you do a good job, they'll increase average day of the gain 5 to 7% and improve uh, feed efficiency too. So for a two or three dollar implant, you can probably get ten or twenty dollars back in return. So do a good job of implanting. Um, I know the cell barns always comment, "No implants, boys, no implants." But in reality, uh, feed unless you're selling all natural cattle, uh, the feed yards uh, they implant cattle too, and they know that implants. There's a certain way of of using low potency implants during backgrounding, medium potency implants at the beginning of feeding, and high potency at potency implants at the end of the feeding phase. And with that, um, you can stage up production and implants does not affect how you implant your calves with a low potency implant during backgrounding does not affect feed yard performance later on. Uh, be sure to control coccidiosis. Boy, that's one thing you just want to prevent from happening. And it's a stress. When you have too much stress in your cattle, you can end up with a coccidiosis outbreak. Usually you see it with bloody scours, but they can be nervous coxie as well. You can feed a dequinate in the ration to prevent it from happening, or you can feed amprolium to help prevent, or for treatment, um, if you do have it. I just like to say, only give cattle one stress at a time. If there's a weather stress, don't wean them. If there's a weaning stress, hopefully don't do it during, we during a weather outbreak. If you're going to change rations from one ration to a higher energy ration, that's another stress. If you're going to commingle cattle, that's another stress. I always get a kick out of, so you have coccidiosis outbreak can happen when you have a 30 below weather change. I say it's 30 below for, for two days. That's a stress on calves. It's cold. Um, they're not used to it yet. And surprisingly enough, about three days after the onset of the stress, coccidiosis outbreaks can occur. Again, it's stress related. Maybe they need more bedding more attention paid to them. So let's just summarize all this by saying feed prices are lower this year. Average daily gains, as you go higher, the cost of putting the gain on usually is lower. You have lots of ration op options. It all depends upon the feed resources that you have available. Co products are uh, really available in North Dakota. They're high in protein, higher in fiber, work quite well in backgrounding rations. And by all means, please consider good feed management leads to good calf gains or low-cost calf gains. So with that, Carl Hoppe, Extension Livestock Specialist, the Carrington Research Extension Center, thank you for listening to this video. Mm -hmm.